getting so excited. I hope that you enjoy my goofy dogs. Whenever I was prepping for this message, I knew that I would have to have an illustration because I cannot talk without an illustration. I think it's physically impossible. I am a visual learner. Anyone else a visual learner? Some of you, can, like my husband, can learn things just by look, hearing them or looking at them, and I really cannot. I need to be able to see them, to wrap my brain around them. And I really love it when a year later, I can see something and remember just because I saw something that stuck with me. So I chose the Goober, actually I let Kellen choose the Goofy Dog video so that I would have one for today because my illustration for today is going to be this wonderful dog leash. So I am going to call a volunteer up to help me out in a little bit, all right? Richard, <coughs> I'll call you whenever it's time. Um, <laughs> I, I told him, I said, you are brave. If you are brave, I will use you this morning. And he said he was brave. So I'm going to take him at face value. Um, so this morning, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua 1. I want you to turn with me to Joshua 1, because technically, um, I'm going to take you all the way through Joshua this morning, from Joshua 1 through Joshua 6. Okay? Now, I'm not going to read six chapters to you, I promise, but I want to take you through them for a reason. You know, I feel like all of us are on a journey a bit. We've all been led somewhere in different times. Now, sometimes you're led forcefully. You do not have a choice. And then sometimes you get to choose your path. But God is always leading us, whether we recognize it or not. God is the one leading us. Now, sometimes I feel like, you know, yesterday we, we accidentally let the donkeys out of Trace's fence. <laughs> and then we got to chase said donkeys down the street. And I imagine if anyone had a camera, oh goodness, we looked ridiculous trying to herd donkeys like this back into the gate. Um, but I feel like that's what we do. <laughs> Instead of allowing God, just gently, let's go. Let's go this way. Instead, we're just careening off down the street, no idea where we're going, avoiding at all costs God trying to give us direction. We do it the hard way. Do we not? Yes, we, do. we do it the hard way. So I want to show you an example today of someone who I feel like gives us a guide for how to do it the right way. So I want to take you through the book of Joshua. Joshua is actually the scripture God gave us back in September Actually, I think it was in October um, when we decided that this was where God was bringing us and the way that God was leading us. He gave us a scripture in Joshua to hold on to. And so I started studying the book of Joshua, and now I feel like I've been studying Joshua for six months. Um, and I actually wrote two messages this week because I was like, God, what do you want me to do? And he was like, no, take him to Joshua. So I am taking you to Joshua today. Um, I think it's interesting, just a couple of tidbits about the book of Joshua before we dive in because I thought they were really cool. Um, the historical purpose of the book of Joshua is to show you how God takes back what's been taken from him. That is the purpose of Joshua. Some people don't like the book of Joshua because it is about 23 chapters full of battles and wars. The Israelites are always at war in the book of Joshua. The reason is because by the end of the book, Joshua has taken the armies of the Lord to battle 31 times and taken 31 cities. He essentially led God's army to take back every piece of land that had been taken from them. So it's actually not a book of war at all. It's a book of God reclaiming what was his. Um, and so I really enjoyed that. Uh, in Numbers 20, Moses actually does something with Joshua that I didn't know happened. Names in the Bible, they mean a lot. Well, Joshua was originally named Hoshea, which was in Hebrew. Moses changed his name in Numbers 30 to Jehoshua or Yeshua, which in Greek is Jesus. It means the Lord saves. So Joshua is actually the foreshadowing of Jesus himself, even in name, as Joshua saves the Israelite people and Jesus saves the world. So I thought that was a really beautiful picture, kind of foreshadowing of what Joshua does. Um, I also think it's really cool, also, it's all right. I'm going to get there. I also think it's really cool that Joshua was a young man in slavery in Egypt, grew up under Moses, experienced the parting of the Red Sea, 40 years wandering in the wilderness. He ate manna 
he got to go up on the mountain with Moses into the presence of God that saw the Ten Commandments. Joshua saw all of it. And then God decides, you're next. You have found favor in my eyes. Now you get to be the one to take them into the promised land. So Joshua, his story arc is just incredible in the way that he takes them on this journey. Um, so those are my like neat tidbits that I liked about the story of Joshua. But Joshua starts out a little insecure. Now I know none of y'all know what that's like at all. Um, but he starts out a little insecure. In the first chapter of Joshua alone, God tells him to be strong and courageous. And you think you get it. That echo is killing me. I sound really like, I am the voice of God. Like that's what it sounds like to me. I know, that's what I hear in my head. Um, in the first chapter, ooh, fancy, that sounds good. Uh, in the first chapter alone, God has to tell him to be strong and courageous eight times in one chapter. You would think that the chosen man of God who'd been to Egypt, who'd seen the 40 years, who ate the manna, going to the prom, you would think he would need to hear it eight times. But how many of y'all have kids? Can you tell them anything one time? Oh, like eight times is not enough, is it? No. <laughs> eight times is never enough. Sometimes we need to hear from God over and over and over again. Not necessarily because we're disobedient, because he wants to put within us that reminder, that constant reminder. So my first um, thought I want to give you is that God gave Joshua a promise. Okay, so on this journey of life where we are being led by God, like Joshua was led by God, it had to start with the promise. I'm going to read to you in Joshua 1, 3 through 6. It says, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to the greater river and a whole bunch of city names and to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. You will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So it starts with a promise. Joshua had to know what he was called to do. He had to know. Now, did that mean that Joshua was going to immediately lead the people? Just let's do it. God said, I have a promise. Let's go. I'm leading you. Doesn't always happen that way either. How many of y'all had a promise from God in some way or the other? And then inevitably, the next part was wait, the wait. <laughs> and you see that in Joshua's story. In the first right there, he gives you a promise because you need a push. You need an end goal. You need some inkling of what he has for you. It doesn't mean you get the whole picture, but it does mean that he gives you the little push you need the little glimpse of where he wants you to go. Maybe that's a career. Maybe that's a calling for some type of ministry in your life. You know, I had a, I had a friend growing up who really, really enjoyed like outreach or, or homeless ministry and always wondered what in the world will I do for God with that? Like, where would I work? What would I do? It was almost as if God had to give them a heart for something that mattered to them. And then they had to wait and kind of figure it out. And walk out, what does that mean to find what God has for me? You get a glimpse at the beginning, the way Joshua got this promise. But he wasn't there yet. And then you go to the second part of the way God leads us. He encourages us. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous again. He encourages us throughout this process. I, I really enjoy when God encourages me much more than when he gets on to me. You know, I, um, when, when I came to the Lord, I was pretty much running in the opposite direction of anything God would have for me. And I experienced a season where life just kind of nosedived. <laughs> and when God wants to talk to you, it is so much like a parent. You know, there are plenty of times where my kids do something real stupid. And then I just have to, hey, I love you. You cannot do that. For whatever reason, 
you are hurting yourself. You are hurting others. You are, there are reasons. And I feel like God talks to us like that if we'll let him, if we'll listen. You know, much sometimes like a teenager will not listen when a parent tries to talk to them. I feel like we're just as bad with God. We have no excuse to get on to teens who don't want to listen to their parents because we don't want to listen to ours either. And it's like God wants to talk to us and be like, hey, can we work on this? Your life would be better if you would work on this. If we could talk about this. Oh, God, not that. Not that. Sorry, that's off limits. It's just that ability to listen to God, whether it's the encouraging side or the dealing with stuff side. Because he's going to encourage you throughout the process. I feel like God's the type that he sneaks it in there a little bit almost. It's like, hey... I love you. You're doing great. Can we work on this right here? But you're doing great. I'm really proud. Like, I feel like he does that little sandwich method, you know, where you just throw the thing in the middle that you need to work on and then you surround it by the good stuff. I feel like he does that with us. And I think I see this, um, the way sometimes that we don't want God to lead us or we don't allow God to lead us. The visual I got was with a dog because I like dogs. <laughs> I have two dogs, and they are a total handful. But this morning, I didn't think Trace would want my dog in his restaurant. So I didn't bring her. So instead, I have Richard. (laughs) Richard, come help me out real quick. Be strong and courageous. I'd like to say that, you know, I didn't know this was about Joshua before we started this. You didn't know how my feelings are. I do. I do. Okay, so find a place where you are comfortable hooking that. <laughs> I can't do it with the suspenders. It's not fair. Uh, I'm not going to. No, he, he can handle that. He can handle that. How many of you have walked a dog? What? Have you ever walked a dog? Yeah. It's okay. I got I'm you. A dog. I got you. If you've ever walked a dog, You know, the first five minutes of the walk, they just drag you around. They just, go ahead, fool. Go for it. They You go ahead. They just drag you around. And if you're anything like me, you spend half the time doing this because (laughs) you do this because what are they doing? They're straining to go. They don't care where they go. They're just straining to go. Well, then the truth is, if you got a fancy leash like this one that I got, you can do this. And you can bring them in. And you can bring them back. But what I find is that we want God to lead us like that. Where dogs don't want to be that way, we do. We want the safety of the leash. We want to be like, oh, I'm going this way. And you want God to go, oh, no, that's a bad, that's a bad idea. Come back, come back. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. And we want God to keep us out of danger, God. Keep us us safe, God. And God's wanting to... Do this. But we like the safety of the leash. We like God to pull us out of danger. To, to we want God to do that. We want God, what's your will, God? Oh, this is it. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stay right here. But God wants, he gives us that free will. He wants us to be able to make these choices on our own. But we struggle. We struggle with letting God lead us. In a way that you don't see with Joshua. Thank you. Can y'all give Richard a good hand? He was such a good man. <laughs> I had so much fun imagining that in my head. Yeah. <laughs> but it's this picture that sticks with us. That sometimes we want God to lead that way. But Joshua did such an amazing job. I mean, I think that you would be a little intimidated taking over from Moses. Yeah, just a little bit, you know, parted the Red Sea. It's no big deal. You know, was in the presence of God. No big deal. You'd think that Joshua would really struggle. And in the first chapter, you see God encourage him quite a bit. But you know what you don't see? You don't see him chicken out. You don't see him back down. You don't see him hesitate. Or try to go his own way. One of the things I love is he said, do not let these words stop coming from your mouth. Meditate on these words day and night. Stay close to the wall. God gives him these instructions. And Joshua does it. And in doing so, you get to see him lead an entire nation 
We may not lead nations, but we lead ourselves. We lead our families. We lead our friends. And if we allow God to show us his picture, it helps us to do it better, to understand how God wants us to lead ourselves. So I want to take you real quick to the third way that God moves us and leads us. He moves the pieces into place. The waiting after God gives you a promise is never fun. Waiting is miserable. Waiting rooms are the single most annoying thing in the world. Now, phones do make it a little better. Reading a magazine from seven years ago is not enjoyable, but a phone at least helps you in a waiting room. But waiting in general is not fun. If you've ever sat in traffic, waiting is not fun. If you've ever been looking for a stimulus check in your bank account every day, waiting is not fun. <laughs> It's felt right here. <laughs> waiting is not fun. But what we don't realize is that in our waiting, God is working. In our waiting, he's moving pieces into place. And that's evident in Joshua's story. In Joshua 2.1, it says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim to go and look over the land and said, Look at Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now, there's a lot about Rahab's story that's very interesting. Someone who found favor in God's eyes in a land where everyone was going to get wiped out. It's so funny. I don't have enough time to go into it right now, but I wonder why Rahab. I just, I've always thought of that. They give you no context at all. They just say they went to Rahab's house. How they heard that it was safe, no idea. But that's where they went. While they're waiting to take their promised land, God had already put Rahab in place. She was already waiting on him, already knew what to do. So while they didn't know, and they're just spying and trying to figure things out, God's moving pieces into place to have them ready so that when they take that step, it's already there. The wait is never actually a wait. The wait's part of the process. The fourth thought I had in the way that God leads us is that he requires that we take that first step. I love the thought that God would just swoop in and take us and just do it all for us. But God requires obedience. It's just part of the process. He requires us to be obedient, even as simple as Jesus. The night before he was crucified, he sat in the garden praying, God, not my will, but your will. And he still had to get up and go and go to the cross. That step of obedience is a big deal. Now, I love it here because Joshua knows that God's moving. He knows that they're supposed to take the promised land. It's been given to him. He knows it. Then he sees that God put Rahab in place so they would have just what they need. And you know that his courage has got to be building because he sees the pieces. You see one little piece click into place and you're like, oh, oh, that's it, that's it. Like you get so encouraged when one little thing, when God starts to move something in your life that you need. Well, now he's seeing that next thing and he knows what's coming next. But there's a pretty big challenge that lies between them. And that's the River Jordan. It is an enormous river that in the chapter, they say, is at flood, pain, uh, flood plain levels. It was the highest point of the wet season that it could be. So the river was outside of its banks, essentially. And an entire army has to cross it. Now, he's seen the Red Sea, but that was Moses. That wasn't him. And it says... And the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 3, 7, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel, so they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now, I find it interesting. He didn't say, go stand in the river because I'm going to split the water. He didn't say that. All he said was, go stand in the river. Has God ever told you to do something you feel like an idiot? I have. He said, just, just go stand in the river. Can you imagine if they just went out there with their ark and just stood there? I'm in the river. Like, you just have that moment where you think, he didn't tell them what he was going to do. He just said, do it. But what's awesome is that 
as he tells you, I love the next part, because when they went, he moved. All you have to do is walk across. All you have to do is walk across. I hear Dory in my head, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I hear, I have children, I'm so sorry. Um, you just have to go. That step of obedience, that toe in the water was all it took for God to provide Joshua exactly what they needed. He didn't know how it was going to happen, but he knew if he obeyed. It says, now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water stopped flowing. It piled up in a great heap at a town called Adam, and while the water flowing down to the sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed until the whole nation had completed crossing on dry ground. That one step of obedience, as soon as the priest's toes touched the water, it stopped flowing. All they had to do was walk across. When God leads us, it looks like this process. He gives us a promise and it sounds amazing and it sounds great. And then we're terrified and we don't know how to do it. So he encourages us and he builds us up. And as he encourages us, he's moving pieces into place so that our wait isn't so long. He's moving these pieces into place and then he requires that we do what? We take the first step. And then as we begin to go, just like the story of the prodigal son, he meets us. When we go, he moves. He meets us where we're at. Now, I find it interesting, um, kind of my, I would say my sixth thought. Weirdly, I don't write sermons like this normally. God did something weird this week, and I have a ton of points. But the sixth thought is that your memories are really important. I say this for a reason, because Joshua demonstrates for this for us. In Joshua 4, he said to the Israelites, in the future when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones you've piled up here mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan just as he had done the Red Sea. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful so that you may always fear the Lord your God. These memories are so important because you may get a promise from God. You may get encouraged. You may see the pieces moving. You might take that step. You might walk across. But what's amazing about Joshua's story is it doesn't get any easier at that point. It only gets harder. But Joshua told them, put something here so you remember exactly what God did. Because guess what? In six months, when it's really hard, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to look at those stones again. You're going to say, God, you did it. I know you did it. You can do it again. You need that. You need the reminders. How many, okay, this is a random question, but we all went to high school at some point in life, right? Some of y'all was a real long time ago. <coughs> Trace. But <laughs> we all went at some point. You know what's sad? I can't remember half of it. I don't remember most of it. I really don't. It's like this blur in the back of my brain 20 years ago, and it, I can't believe it. Like, I would have thought it was the most important time of my whole life. No, I don't remember it all. But we are like that. The stones have to be there. Or we don't remember why we're doing what we're doing in the first place. We lose sight of the call of God on our life if we don't have something to take us back to when he called us. There has to be that thing that you hold on to. You know, for some people, it's the simplest of things. There was a song playing the night I gave my life to the Lord for the first time. Yikes, I was 12. The song was called Worlds Apart by a band named Jars of Clay. And it was the glorious Christian music of the 90s. <laughs> and if I hear that song today, I tear up. 
because my mind remembers what my 12 year old little self sitting in the, the room at ki- uh, youth camp heard the altar call and walked down to that song. I remember. And it holds a special place in my heart. But through the years, God has given us many of those, those stone moments. The Israelites, they piled up stones next to the Jordan so that they would remember. And so they could remind future generations. Because this journey is just, it's, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not just about you. I mean, it'd be lovely to think that all of this is about God giving us the life we want. All of our dreams are going to come true. If you wish upon a star. But that's not what this is about. This is about building God's kingdom here on earth. Because everybody needs him. This life is hard enough. Doing it without God? Can you imagine how miserable and lost and depressed? Oh, that's right. That's pretty much what's going on all around us. Because they all need God in their life so desperately. And it is our job to help lead them as God leads us. And so Israelites, they piled up stones. Some of us have scriptures that we hold on to that God gave us in a certain season. You may have songs. You may have people. You know, the only reason that I'm doing what I'm doing today is because of a girl named Melissa Strange. And she'll probably never see this. But if she does, hi, Melissa. Um, That girl, my sophomore year of high school, I got kicked out of school because I got in a lot of trouble. Um, And my walk with God was not a good one. It, It was a roller coaster. And so when I got kicked out of school, my parents didn't know what to do with me. And they heard of this summer camp for people that wanted to be preachers one day. And they figured if anything had a shot of setting me straight, that would be it. So they shipped me off to this preacher camp. And it took a good solid week, even at preacher camp, for God to get a hold of me again. But in that moment, that girl fought for me to get there. She paid my way working her summer job so that we could get there, so that I could get there because she knew how desperately I needed the Lord back in my life. And so I have her name and I lives across the country now. I haven't seen her in probably 20 years, but she'll always be something I go back to sometimes. You have to identify what it is that you go back to. What reminds you of what God called you to? What reminds you of your salvation? of what all of this means to you. You have to hold on to it. Joshua had to hold on to it. He's telling the Israelites, hold on to it, because guess what? The next generation, they won't have seen the waters part. They won't know. And you have to tell them. And that's part of our job. The seventh thought I had was that it won't be easy, but he's working all the time. As soon as they cross the Jordan and they're getting ready to do what God asked of them, they had to face Jericho. Heavily fortified city, giant walls all around it. And even though the waters parted, they were still terrified. Be strong and courageous. And Joshua 5.1 says, When the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the river, Their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. I love it. Joshua hadn't even tried to take Jericho yet. They hadn't actually fought a battle. All they did was walk across the river. And all the kings, their hearts melted in fear, and they couldn't even face the Israelites. I love it. Because God is using your obedience to begin to eliminate some of the things that stand in your way. Things that would have been strong enough to take you out, except you were obedient. The eighth thought in the last one here was that the promise was just the beginning. The work comes next. Jericho was a big challenge. Jericho was work, right? And even though God gave them a way that they were going to do it, march around the city. That all this process that God had for them, it was a lot of work. 
We cannot be scared of the work side of the way God wants to lead us. God wants to lead us if we let him. But it requires us doing some of the work. It's crazy to me because the way God led Joshua is the way God leads us. I mean, if you look at other people in the Bible, it's the same thing. King David, God gave him a promise. Then he had to wait. Then he had to be obedient. Then there was a battle. Like there's this process of the way that we're led. It's not mystical. Oh, I wish God would lead me. I wish he would tell me his will for my life. Grab onto your promise from God, whatever it is, and then put one foot in front of the other. Do the work. Go. Be obedient. Let God lead you. And be strong and courageous. I was telling him in prayer this morning, one of the things that I absolutely loved about Joshua is at the end of the story, in Joshua 23, he's 110 years old and he's getting ready to pass away. And he pulls everyone together for one last message. And from Joshua 1 to Joshua 23, you know what that last message is? Be strong and courageous. <laughs> he is finally able to pass on what God gave him. Joshua gives us a roadmap of how God leads us through situations. These first five chapters, you see it took a long time. It was a process of Joshua finding out how God led him. But what's really cool is in chapter six, when they battle Jericho, it's much faster. God says, I'm giving you Jericho. Here's the instructions. Go, takes Jericho. It's a much quicker process. And I feel like it's like that with us too. The very first time that God leads you, it's, it feels like a lot. This is new. This is scary. Please remind me that I'm not crazy. Please tell me to be strong and courageous. Okay, I'm going to stick my toe in the water. I'm going to try. And it's this long, drawn-out process. But once you've been obedient and you've seen God moving pieces into place, guess what? The next time, it's so much easier. It's not easy. But once you know you know. This morning, I really believe that it's interesting. It's interesting to me that we would so often come back to the story of Joshua in our journey here to Burnett. Because I, I see it a lot like Jericho. There's a lot of walls built up around the city. But God doesn't care about them. God doesn't care about what walls are built around this political thing or, or this church thing or this school thing or this. God doesn't care about any of that. God wants to use his people to set the rest of the city free. But it starts with you being free, with you realizing what God has called you to do. So if you would this morning, I want you to stand to your feet real quick. And I just want you to close your eyes so that you can think for a second so you're not distracted. Not anything super spiritual about closing your eyes. It's really just helps you not be distracted. So in this moment, I want you to ask yourself, on this journey of God leading you, what part are you struggling with? Are you struggling with the promise? Maybe God hasn't made you a promise yet. Maybe this walk with him is still pretty new and you don't know what your promise is. Maybe this morning you need God to give you a promise, a glimpse, a push so that you know which direction to head. Maybe, maybe you have the promise, but you need that encouragement. It's scary, it's a lot. And you need to hear be strong and courageous a lot. You need God to, to kind of wrap you up this morning and give you that, that big hug, <laughs> that big bear hug that you need because you're trying and it's hard. Maybe you're in the wait, and God's 
moving stuff around behind the scenes, but to you it feels like you're standing still. And you need him to remind you that he's working. Or maybe it's all ready to go. And you just have to be bold enough to cross the river. To go. To put your foot in the water before it stops running. Because when you do, he'll meet you. God, this morning I know that you have us here for a reason. That you want us to see, God, what it means to live this life for you. To do it for real. Not some churchy version of anything, but just a real life, us and you, together. God, I ask this morning that, that in our hearts, we would take a moment, like Joshua, to trust you again today for whatever part of the journey that we're on. God, today we want you to lead us. Whatever direction it is, God, we just want to go. Remind us today of that moment where you showed us you were real, God. When you moved, remind us of that moment.